Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AP English. And we turn in our study now of Dante's Inferno to canto number six, the gluttons, those who eat too much. And if you eat too much in life, then in Dante's hell, you are going to get jacked for that. So we'll have some conversation about that one. Now, if you haven't been following my stuff at LearnStrong.net, I recommend that you hit that AP folder. We are expecting then of you in these conversations that you have followed us from the Iliad and full discussions of the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid, and then all of the texts that we have studied up through and including um, 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 uh, Augustine's Confessions. We also have given individual lectures now over Cantos 1 through 5. Let's do a real quick review of that. In Canto 1, of course, we are at the date of uh, April the 7th, year 1300. We're going to have more to say about, the, about specifically that date in this discussion. He's 35 years old, um, lost in a dark wood, needs Virgil to help him to get, uh, to, get you know, to enlightenment. Um, in Canto 2, we have the invocation of the muse, help us uh, here, and Virgil tells him that Beatrice is the one that sent him, um, and Dante is ready for his trip. In Canto 3, we have the inscription of hell, abandon hope all ye who enter here, and the uh, realm of the uncommitted. They never could make up their mind, and so they are, uh, they are jacked. Um, and then, of course, we meet Asher on the, uh, the, the um, ferryman over the river. And then Dante will faint. In Book 4, we've got Limbo and Circle Number 1. The unbaptized pagans are going to uh, show up here. Homer, Virgil, Aristotle will all be there. In Canto 5, we enter Circle 2. These are, of course, the jacked lovers. We've got Dido, we've got Francesca telling her story about her and Paolo, and blaming, of course, first love and then a book. Now we will turn to Canto 6. Now again, just to remind, the hope is that you're reading this material on your own and then using me. Our learning theory to be reminded again, the connecting of new information to old information in meaningful ways. In our annotative approach at level one, we ask, what does this text say? At level two, we ask, what does this text mean? Two A messages, themes. And then at 2B, we're concentrating on symbolism and irony. And as well, we're asking to see Dante as poet, as pol politician. That's huge for book six here, our canto six, and as philosopher. Finally, at level three, we ask, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way? At 3A, relating, of course, to all the things that we've been working with, starting especially with the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid. We're going to have uh, some references mostly to the Odyssey here, just simply because of uh, the, the way in which Dante is playing games, borrowing uh, um, from, from Homer's Odyssey. And finally, we'll ask, how can you relate to this information personally? Let's do a real quick summary of Canto Six. We are in Circle Three. Again, these are the gluttons. Um, they're like pigs, right? We see them like pigs, and in fact, we meet uh, a, a, a person who probably, without Dante's uh, work here, or maybe mentioned by Dante's contemporary Boccaccio, Boccaccio may be mentioning him because of Dante, uh, a guy named Chaco, whose, uh, whose name means hog, okay? Now, these are people that ate too much in life, and so they're punished by standing in disgusting, wretched, stench-ridden kind of rain that falls on them. It's a really gross word picture. We are then going to get from uh, and through Chaco a prophecy about Florence, and here we're going to meet our political Dante. Put a note to yourself that in the Divine Commedia, in Book Six of Inferno, we get po uh, political Dante. In Book Six of Purgatorio, we get more politics, and in Book Six of Paradise, we get the same kind of political observations. So it's an easy mnemonic for us. Finally, in the end of this canto, we get some comments about the final judgment day as well, and a return back to Aristotelian science. So we'll, we'll play those games as we go. All right, let's turn now to the text itself. This is Canto 6. Upon my mind's return from swooning shut at hearing the piteous tale of those two kin, Francesco and, and, uh, and Paolo, which confounded me with sadness at their plight, I see new torments and tormented once again wherever I step or look. I'm in the third circle, a realm of cold and heavy rain, a dark accursed torrent eternally poured with changeless measure and nature. By the way, let's pause for a moment and point out, Dante often is playing games that was fairly popular in the medieval period. We see this in Shakespeare as well, that bad weather means bad stuff. I mean, today we have bad weather. We just kind of go, oh, well, it's just bad, you know, bad storm. But for Dante's time, bad weather, you know, seemed to be like a bad omen of a kind. So you'll see this, right? Bad weather. It's really, it's really nasty. Nasty rain. Okay. Enormous hail and tainted water mixed with snow are showered steadily through the shadowy air of hell. 
So it's this disgusting kind of rain that falls. The soil they drench gives off a putrid odor. So notice all five senses are constantly being elicited through Dante's Inferno. But Dante the Pilgrim will focus on, or Dante the Poet will help Dante the Pilgrim to experience um, usually one or two of these. So notice in this one it's going to be the stench, the smell, it's gross. Then we also will have three-headed service. Now service, you'll remember from our study of, of the Aeneid, that three-headed dog. And of course there's a whole history and mythology about this three-headed dog. You'll remember that Hercules comes down to the underworld and steals him. You'll remember that there, some observation is made about that in Aeneid 6, right? Three-headed Servius, monstrous and cruel, barks dog-like at the souls immersed here, louder for his triple throat. In other words, a dog who has three heads that's always wanting to eat all the time makes sense for a monster in, uh, the, in the circle where the gluttons are. His eyes are red, his beard grease black. It's almost as if service for Dante, at least one of those three heads is kind of like human that has a beard. And he has the belly of a meat feeder and talons on his hands. He claws the horde of spirits. He flays and quarters them in the rain. Now, you can kind of see how this is working, right? In terms of that whole notion of um, compassero and all, and all of that, you know, retribution and proper punishment fits the crime and all of that. Think of it. In life, they sat around and they over ate, they overfed. Now, in their afterlife, they're like pigs in, in the mire, right? Sloshing around like hogs, right? He claws the horde of spirits, he flays and quarters them in the rain. The wretches, howling like dogs, where they are mired and pelted, squirm about again and again, turning to each to make each side a shield for the other. So there they are in the in the disgusting filth and putridness with the stench. Seeing us, service made his three mouths yawn to show the fangs. His reptile body a quiver in all its members. So it's, it's interesting. It's kind of almost got like a reptilian uh, body to it. My leader, Virgil, reaching out to fill both fists with as much as he could gather through gobbets of earth down each voracious throat. So, you know, I mean, think about this. You'll remember in Aeneas 6, uh, uh, at line 554, uh, we had uh, 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 Sybil doing something similar with Aeneas, only there it was a, remember, a honey cake, right? Here, look at this disgusting filth that picks, he picks up and he throws it to feed him so that the dog then won't eat them. Just as the barking, just as a barking dog grows suddenly still the moment he begins to gnaw his meat, struggling and straining to devour it all, so the foul faces of service became who thundered so loudly at the souls in hell. They wished that they were deaf. So now we've got, we've got stench and we've got sound right. We too had come over the shades subdued by the heavy rain, treading upon their emptiness, which seemed like real bodies. So notice, gluttons usually are associated with uh, being corpulent, large, but notice here, they're, they're shades. And he says, we walked over them, but we didn't even realize that we walked over them, right? All lay, and by the way, Make that observation about the importance of the body because we're going to come back to that at the end of this canto. All lay on the ground but one who sat up seeing us pass. You who are led through this hell, recognize me if you can. You who were made before I was unmade. In other words, hey, I can recognize that you're from, you're, you're from above. I hope that you can recognize me. This need to be recognized, by the way, this is Chaco who is speaking, whose name actually means hog. And there's been a lot of debate about this, about this person. He does seem to come up maybe in Boccaccio, one of Boccaccio's stories, and there's a debate about whether Dante got it from Boccaccio, Boccaccio got it from Dante, or they both knew. I mean, think about this. Florence was not that large of a city. You could walk across it pretty quickly. It was a city that was surrounded by walls, as most of these cities were in Italy at the time. And so everybody inside knows everybody inside. It's kind of like, you know, our, our high school, our small high school, where everybody knows everybody and everybody's business. So in other words, this is a real person of Dante's time who now makes it in, and we're going to have an exchange, an eye to him. So Dante the Pilgrim will speak. The anguish you endure, perhaps he faces whatever memory I had, making it seem I have not seen you before. In other words, I don't recognize you. But tell me who you are. This will, of course, echo um, the question of the Phaeacians towards Odysseus. Assign so sad a station as punishment. If any is more agony, none is so repellent. In other words, this is a pretty gross place that I'm in right now. And quite frankly, you're kind of grossing me out. You're repellent. He said, your city, Florence. Now, this is Dante as politician. 
making his observation about Florence. And this is brilliant, right? Because he gets to make his observations about Florence now from exile outside of Florence. He says, Your city, so full of envy that the sack spills over, held me once when I enjoyed the bright life up above. In other words, I lived in your city, Florence, and it is an avaricious city. It's a city that's very greedy and envious, full of envy, right? The name I took among you citizens was Chaka. The sin of gluttony brought me here. You see me soak to ruin in battering rain, but not alone, for all these around me share the same penalty for the same transgression as mine. Then he fell silent, but I answered him, Chaco, I feel your misery. This is significant. Dante the Pilgrim tells us again and again, right, as he, or, or Dante the Poet tells us that Dante the Pilgrim feels, has powerful compassion for these poor souls that are lost there. Of course, Dante the Poet will want to point out that Dante the Pilgrim at first begins to look at these people as somehow other from him and then finally begins to identify, oh, if I don't clean my act up, I'm going to be just as painfully sad or alone or whatever, right? And so he says, I feel your misery. Its weight bids me to weep. But what of things to come? Now, let's put this in your notes. This is a brilliant, brilliant contrivance by Dante the Poet. He writes his poem, as we have already said, 1300. He's writing his poem during 1308 to finish it in 1320. So by the time he finishes his poem, 20 years has passed. And what Dante can do, because the poems is set in the year 1300, is that Dante can quote-unquote make prophecies that are not actually prophecies, that is to say, it's stuff actually that's already happened. But in the context of the poem, it's coming. In other words, he asks, what is it that I that, that's coming? What does the future look like? What are things to come? Tell if you can the divided city's fate. Florence is divided, not because of the Guelph Ghibelline contest as much as, although that comes to mind, more about the Guelphs, the white Guelphs, the black Guelphs, and of course Dante was on the wrong side as we as we pointed out before. Tell if you can the divided city's fate and of the citizens. Is any one just? Now this will remind us. Of, uh, of a story from the Bible when you'll remember that Sodom and Gomorrah story where Lot I, 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 or uh, where um, Abraham and God are going to have a conversation about is there anybody actually just in Sodom and Gomorrah? Can I find just 10 good men? Uh, this, by the way, Genesis 18.32 and following. Well, we've got the same game being played here. Is anyone just? And by the way, the, way, the, the reason that it's so significant that we read our, our, our Plato and especially Republic is notice here the question of justice. Is anyone just meaning is there a single good man it left in all of in, in, in all of Florence? And tell me why such schism threatens it. Do you remember when we did the declension of state argument discussion from uh, Plato's Republic Book Eight Nine, the declension of state? Remember that little model that we said so uh, Plato's very interested. Socrates very interested in three things: the beginning of a of a group of people, a republic of polis. The rise, the ascension, happens because of what? Harmony. And then the decline of those people. Do you remember this? So that there's this uh, third third element. And why the decline? Because of a somehow disharmony. So here we get it, right? What's going on with the schism that threatens it? And Chaco now is going to answer. After long argument, they must descend to bloodshed. So in other words, it starts out as arguing, it ends up as bloodshed and violence. And the rustic block, that is to say the whites, those who come from the country, the one that uh, Dante ultimately will be identified with, with much offense will expel the other first. Then, through the power of one who, uh, while we speak, is temporizing, here we're talking about Boniface VIII, that party too will fall within three years, the ousted coming back with head held high. In other words, the whites are going to be in control for a brief period of time, Boniface is going to come back, Boniface VIII, and he's going to change the tide and of course, this will explain why Dante gets exiled. And long will they prevail despite the others' cries of shame and despair under their burdens. Dante comes to mind as one of those who is making that cry. Only two men of all are truly just, whose words the rest ignore. For the triple sparks of envy, greed, and pride ignite their hearts. Now, this discussion about the two men... Uh, some have seen this as maybe Dante is one of them and then maybe someone else who we're not exactly sure. 
Maybe the number two is kind of like the game that's getting played in Genesis 1832, where can you find me ten good people in all of Sodom and Gomorrah, I'm going to destroy the city, and you can't even find ten good people. By the way, notice the threes again here of envy, greed, and pride. Of course, playing with three of the seven deadly sins. Let's just put them in your notes, because we're going to see all of them addressed, and in Purgatory, we're going to hear all of them addressed as terraces. Pride, greed, of course, greed being mentioned here, lust, we know about that one from the last circle. Envy, we got that one here. Gluttony, we got that one here. Wrath, that one's coming for us. And then sloth or laziness, well, that one's coming. Although gluttony and sloth oftentimes seem to kind of come together, don't they? He, uh, he continues, I'd have you tell me more, I pleaded, once his grievous words were spoken. In other words, I want to know more. And now we're going to get an interesting list of five dead Florentine politicians who will come back again, with the exception of one of them, in the Inferno, all right? Farinata will be mentioned, we'll come back to him. Mosca will be mentioned, Tegejo, men of good reason, and then we'll have Restuki, and then all of these will come back, and then we will have Ergo. Ergo is the only one that will only be mentioned here and not come back. The good was their heart's purpose in life, so tell what portion their souls inherit. Now, in other words, those were good men, Tell me, what, you know, what, what, what about those guys? Tell me about them. I long to know if they feel heaven's sweetness or infernal poison. Did they go to heaven or hell? And then Chaco. Their souls are among the blackest in hell. Ouch. So here again, as we said before, if you are a Florentine reading this poem and you are now to the sixth book, you go, okay, so he's starting to name names and, you know, kick butt and take names and all of that. I, I hope I don't end up in, you know, I hope I don't end up in one of his gantos, right? With different faults that weigh them to the pit, by the way, these uh, the four of these five are going to come back in Canto 10 and 28 of Inferno. If you descend that far, you may see them all. And in fact, this will happen, for Inada comes to mind as one of those. But pray you, when you return to earth's sweet light, now Chaco, recall my memory there to the human world. Uh, it's fascinating, and scholars have pointed this out. Early on in Inferno, when Dante runs across people from Florence, they want him to go back and say, hey, will you help to remind people about me? I want to be remembered. We almost think about that whole Cleo's fame thing. But as you get further into hell where there's more and more disturbing sins, these people in hell, they increasingly do not want to be remembered. They don't want to give up their identity and who they are. Certainly, they don't want to be recalled by people who are still alive, right? He says, now, line 81, now I respond and speak no more. With that, his eyes went crooked and squinted. His head rolled. He's going to like faint. He regarded me a moment, then bent his head and fell back down with the others, blind and quelled. So in other words, he faints, right? And then Virgil's going to speak. He will not wake again, my master said, until the angel's conclusive trumpet sounds and the hostile power comes and the waiting dead wake to go searching for their unhappy tombs and resume again the form and flesh they had, and here that which eternally resounds. In other words, now, judgment day. In other words, interestingly, Chaco's going to lay down and have no pain whatsoever until judgment day when everyone goes in search of their bodies according to Catholic theology. So with slow steps, we traverse that place of mud through rain and shades commingled, once or twice speaking of the future life. In other words, tell me about the future. And so I said, now, this is Dante as philosopher. Dante is theologian. Let's talk about the future. Master, he says, these torments, tell me, will they increase after the judgment or lessen or merely endure burning as much as now? This is an interesting theological question. We're in 1300 BCE, but there's some final judgment that's coming as forecasted in Christian theology coming in the future. What happens to all these people, right? I mean, that's his question. What happens to all these people in hell after the judgment? Well, their torments become less or become more uh, um, uh, burning as they are now. By the way, notice the verb burning because we haven't seen yet a lot of burning other than metaphorically burning. That is to say, burning for carnal pleasures or in this case, burning for food. He said, in this, go back to your science. And of course, here by science, he means Aristotle and, and, and Aquinas' science. Go back to your science, which teaches that the more a creature is perfect, the more it perceives the good and likewise pain. 
In other words, we've got an interesting mind-body idea going on here in Catholic theology, in Christian theology, that argues that at the final day, the body and the soul will be reunited with each other for judgment. And it will be at that moment then that he says the following. The accursed people here can never come to true perfection, not like those in Purgatory and Paradiso, right? Instead, they can expect to come closer then than now. They, they are going to get closer to perfection. Traveling the course of the encircling road and speaking more than I repeat, we too continued our way until the circuit came to where the path descends, and there we saw Plutius, the, the god, uh, the god of wealth in in Greek uh, mythology, the great enemy, and confronted him. Now, this notion of perfection is an interesting one. It says, okay, at, at the final judgment. They, those who are in hell, they will in fact have increased amounts of pain and joy. Joy in terms of knowing what it is that they are missing, so that, that will be a sense of a certain kind of joy. But the pain will be far more acute once they have their bodies to commingle. Finally, of course, notice Plutus is mentioned right at the end, the god of wealth, and we're going to get to the fourth circle where we will be messing around with uh, the idea of those who were greedy or those who never could hold on to a dime, right? Okay, let's jump to two and three levels quickly. 2A, well, this is interesting. You've always heard it, you are what you eat. Dante will play that game, only he looks at it from the perspective of desire. It's not you are what you eat, but you are what you long to eat what you desire to eat. Remember, we are in that area of hell where everyone is kind of undisciplined in some way. Think about the difference, though, between the sins of the previous circle, right? For example, Francesca. That is to say, sins of lust and sex you have with somebody else. But gluttony is often an individual or a more private sin. You sit by yourself and you eat and eat and eat. Of course, another major message is that Florence is full of hogs, full of envious people. We think of Odysseus and the Odyssey and Circe changing all those men into pigs. We are intentionally...